Thank you, honey. Uh, we're given a similar presentation on, on Archicad and the marvelous workflow um, between Grasshopper, Rhino, and Archicad. Uh, he's been working with uh, founded uh, Curve Architecture, and that's been quite a while, right? A couple of years. And you've done work with uh, Rash Rashid? I was, I was business partner with Karim Rashid. Karim Rashid. Yeah, I keep mixing those names the wrong way around. Yeah. Come up here, yeah. tell him yourself. You're way better at that than I am. <laughs> sure. the, sure. the work he's done with Karim was absolutely marvelous. I've, I've seen some of that. It's really interesting on the uh, uh, computational side. I've, I've really enjoyed that. Thank so, but I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Great, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, okay, so today the idea is it's kind of an informal walkthrough of how we've come to use a few different uh, pieces of software. Um, it's a workflow that we've kind of created that works for us. Um, I was telling Andre earlier today, um, you know, we, back in the day, we were all PC-based. Um, I started with a 386 and had to buy a separate processor for AutoCAD. So, uh, this is, you know, 80s. Um, and being PC based for many, many years, in the late 90s, uh, I switched to Mac. And that kind of limited my options in many ways. There was no more AutoCAD, there was no more 3D Studio, there was many things that were detrimental to the, to the way I'd come accustomed to working. And, um, and believe it or not, I, these were handicaps that I imposed upon myself for God knows what reason, but it forced me to find another workflow, which today actually works um, on any platform. Um, actually, what I'm going to show you has a lot of uh, Python, Grasshopper, Rhino, uh, Maya, and then that's where we're creating geometry and where we're creating different uh, scenarios for, for different case studies, which I'll be walking you through. And then ultimately, Archicad has become uh, just the cleanest, fastest, easiest way to bring that data into a CD set, a um, SD set, or what have you. So today, what we're going to do, I'm going to show you three applications of this workflow. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's going to be very um, pragmatic. It's a zoning analysis and how we use the process to analyze zoning, determine what can be built, and quickly model uh, that into a presentation, which is um, a thorough zoning analysis. Um, the second one is how we use it for schematic design, how we um, use the workflow to create new projects um, at schematic design level and how we document them. And then the third is more very creative, loose form finding study, which is basically an extension of the same process. Um, so, and I'm gonna be showing you slides of screenshots. I have the stuff live and we can switch over, show you live at any point. Um, but to risk crashes and those sort of things, I have slides to help us a lot. So um, this is a zoning analysis for a property that's on 57th Street, uh, west of 10th Avenue. Um, you know, you have to do your math and your zoning. You have to know your zoning, of course. And you should, you know, read into what you can build, right? But let's say we know the lot, the block number, the zoning district, and what we can build and we take our notes from from zoning and you know typically the question we receive as architects or sometimes if we're working as development on the owner side as architects is you know what can you build and the old way to do this was you know starting to draw and figuring it out and you know doing math and typically an architect take a couple of weeks to to get back to you on this uh, we have a method which pretty much if you know your zoning well in under 20 under 24 hours, we can give you a 10-page zoning analysis, which is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty accurate. Um, so that when people are evaluating properties, they know beforehand whether or not it makes sense to buy something. And rather than trusting the broker's word for it, or waiting a couple of weeks for an architect who may or may not know what they're doing, um, this gives us a certain degree of factors. So just kind of walking you through how this works, we have a lot. Right, which is a rectangle, you know, or a line, whatever. You get that from the tax map, you get your perimeter, make sure it's the scale. And in Grasshopper, you know, it's very easy to capture that rectangle and find out what the area is, right? May, may or may not match the exact area on the tax map, but at least you know what you're, you're working with, right? 
Um, you get your survey if you have it. Yeah. And you can establish your setbacks, you know, front and back if you know what you're doing. Maybe put a core in there. In this case, the client knew what the core was going to be and how much loss factor he wanted. Uh, this client wanted a 3,600 square foot plate. And he wanted these proportions because he had something in mind in terms of getting a discount on furniture and curtain wall. And who knows why, but it was, a, it was a, you know, 60 by 60 and it was, you know, that's, that's what he wanted. So <clears throat> in Grasshopper, you know, it's very easy when I'm in there to create, and this is basically what you'll see the entire kind of logic of the building, you know, but if I zoom in, you know, you can see here's, here's the lot, right? So by capturing that, if some of you are seeing this for the first time, some of you have a lot of experience with this, so I'll just kind of walk everyone through. But, you know, by selecting the lot and adding it to here, you know, we can, we can actually capture it and then it starts giving us data, right? And that's the square footage of the lot, right? So certain things from the zoning resolution that are, you know, that are inherent to the, to the zoning resolution, whether you have a maximum base height, a maximum building height, uh, a sun angle plane, a setback, these things can actually be visualized. So, you know, you take that same rectangle and you multiply it uh, by a vector that goes up, in this case, 85 feet, and you can change that. You know, let's say, we're just gonna edit this for a second and say, you know, the zoning tells you it's 150 feet, okay? And just click out of this. I think we have so much software going on that certain softwares are taking over other softwares. So I'm just going to edit that and say, okay, you know, give me 105 feet, right? You get the point. So that shows you 105 feet, and that plane, if we zoom out, and I apologize, I have like every scenario running at the same time now. So if my laptop starts crashing, or I can silly, we'll go back to the slides. Um, that green line that you see in here is that information that we just plugged in. So we can start visualizing the envelope of the building, what its restrictions are. In this particular case, we had a setback and we have a, a tower rule. So we can go as high as we want, as long as we're within the sky exposure plane of 58th Street and 57th Street. So for that, we went in there and said, well, what's that angle? You know, it turns into a slope. That slope is 79.87, blah, 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 compared to 90, you know, and you draw that slope here, right? If I change the angle of that slope or the length of the line, you know, it'll, it'll go, you'll see in a second how that line is basically being generated at the sun angle plane into space, right? So again, good way to visualize the envelope quickly. This thing uh, works um, in the sense that, you know, for any particular project, you're always inputting the zoning parameters. And you can also do things, for example, you know, manage your FAR. So if you wanna know what your, you've got your total lot area, you know that already. And you say, well, your community, you know, center FAR is 6.5. And so that gives you a, a quick multiple of, you know, 162,000, right? Commercial would be, um, would be 125,000, et cetera. It's Excel, basically. We're using Excel off a geometric object. There's nothing more to it than that. Why, why is this important? Why am I showing you? Because if you know your zoning and you plug it in, you can quickly see the building envelope, then you can go have fun within that parameter and try to get the max out of your building. And you can do it intuitively in 3D visually instead of trying to remember what your zoning was in the plan section elevation and trying to piece it all together. So when we go down here, and, and I'll walk you through this back in the slides, but this is floor to floor height. And this was a mixed use building. They wanted commercial on the ground floor. They had cellars that were different levels. They were providing, um, they were providing theater space with extra high ceilings in the cellar. Um, they were providing um, 15, 15 uh, sorry, 20, 20 foot ground floor commercial center stories. Then they had a hotel above with 11 feet from floor to floor. And then they had a uh, residential on top of 15. So each one of these represents the floor to ceiling height. And if I were to change this, it would update, you would see the difference in the model automatically. From, from each component type. So let's go back to slides for a second because what, what, what you can see here is the sun angle plane from both sides, sky exposure plane. Um, and I did exactly what the client asked for, which was taking his extrusion and just bringing it up. And this is how most buildings 
were done in the 19th, well, 19th and 20th century by taking a floor plan and repeating it up. And, and you can see how they were losing FAR. They were only about able to get 144,000 of, of building gross. Um, this was the area per slab. You see all that information is broken down. Um, <clears throat> these were the floor to ceiling heights I was showing you. And ultimately, he was losing potential square footage because in section, of course, we're open sky floor So we said, well, look at all that space we'll do. And sure, we can step back, water proof, step back, water proof, step back, water proof, drain, drain, drain. You know how it's going to be crazy, it gets, right? Or we can come up with a shape that, that just makes sense and maximizes the, the lot. And so what we did, I'm taking uh, another path. These are these are little tools which I'll show you that actually take the data from Rhino and plug it into ArchiCAD, so it comes in as a construction document, or at least past SD somewhere in DB before it's a construction document. And so this was the analysis. So basically, by using this tool, and I'll I'll walk you through how it works, um, where in ArchiCAD you can you can have your composites. You can have a glass wall, a curtain wall. You can have uh, you know, solid wall, masonry wall, whatever your wall type is, this is wall type four, which is a glass wall, uh, or height from floor to ceiling, you know, all these things, what layer it's on, uh, renovation layer, you know, et cetera. All these go into um, the box for the settings of a wall section. And that wall section is, is receiving the information from the model. Right? And so <clears throat> going through this, you know, this sheet is automatically generated. We're, we set it up once, the model comes in, it automatically gives you a schedule. Oops, did I just rotate? That's weird. Hold on, sorry. Okay. Too many things on the desktop here. Okay. This is so weird. I'm zooming in and it's rotating. Uh, <laughs> So I just want to command plus has always been zoom. What's going on? Okay. Um, anyway, I'd like to zoom in and show you the details of the gross square footage for the cellar versus the commercial space versus the hotel and and the um, the residences above and. You'll see a, a accumulation of each slab here and the gross square footage of the base. And unfortunately, with this level of yeah, but you know what? It's something something is actually wrong. It's like I think something might have taken over because um, when I use any shortcuts, it won't respond. So there's something going on here. Yeah. Let's do that. So this sheet, again, it's being automatically generated. The information comes into the model. Um, you know, Dynamo does this and, and Revit, you know, but you have to set it up, you know, quite extensively. This is really easy to use. It, it comes in and it calculates the square footage, color codes it if you want. It tells you, you know, your maximum of square footage. And uh, you can see per layer of what we have. So again, you know, there's there's wasted space there. We're not hitting them a maximum FAR because we're we're capping out at the top because of this guy explosion. Right? So, you know, back to what I was saying before, we went and said, well, you know, we could we could have a blob shape with curvature that actually really tangents the two sky exposure places and so fills in that gap. And once we have that, we can squeeze it in the other direction, pull it apart or squeeze it because the lot is quite wide and we can actually maximize the square footage until we get right to the maximum that they are. Of course, there'll be deductions later and we're gonna lose some loss factor in the, in the corridors, but we can continue to update the entire project until it hits the, the sweet spot. And, um, and this was done simply by modeling this freeform, right? bringing it into the program and then <clears throat> running an intersection between the floor plates and the geometry. And that's where it gets a little bit you know, more, more intense because we're at that point, we're beyond just extruding the rectangle 
and working out each commercial floor. You can see here um, we were showing this computer is not liking this. Too many things going on. Um, what you're seeing here in this color coded uh, process is basically taking the commercial perimeter, taking the amount of stories uh, times the height of each story, multiplying that and intersect, intersecting it with the original geometry, getting a curve around that profile and then spinning it out to Archicad so it receives it as a slab which has a floor finish, a subfloor, and a, a structural deck uh, at a certain thickness, which can be updated parametrically. So we built the entire building parametrically based off of zoning analysis. Um, and I can show you here if I dare to update this to 12 stories. And if my computer doesn't crash, you'll see that the building will adjust. And, and what it will do is it'll, it'll move up. And if a floor doesn't fit, you know, it just kind of finds the happy medium and corrects it and shoots it up to the next floor. So we've used this for much simpler projects. Um, we start getting into, you know, redrawing every floor so it's a nice polyline and, and, a, and uh, a crisp line and then getting that through that process out to um, the Graphisoft exporter that spits it out as a, as a polyline with a building building profile for a slab. Um, so to show you, for example, you know, to save time, a lot of times we, we, we pre-build these tools that in Grasshopper will allow us to, to do certain things. So for example, this is what I call the BIM exporter. And um, it's a file that has every type of um, object that, that Archicad will receive, whether it's curtain wall, slab, um, a hatch, uh, a drawing, a text, they're all basically reduced to this. So the point is, once you get the geometry to a, a point where it's ready to, be, to come in, you can export it through here. Now, Archicad has gone as far as um, making it streamlined, so I can open a Archicad file in Rhino, and I can open a Rhino file in Archicad. So I don't necessarily have to do this. Once I have the geometry, I can just simply just open it and skip this process. However, here it gives me a little bit more control as to how it's coming in. So I can preset it here to be on the right layer, to have the right wall thickness. It's a loop between Archicad and Rhino where it picks up all these orange things that are disconnected right now, pick up and it'll tell you what layer you're on and, um, and, and what uh, properties that has before it comes in. So we were able to maximize the square footage, um, stay away from, from our lot boundaries enough to you know, accurately um, present the zoning of the building. And um, you know, we lost a lot in the process because the owner had less control over our lots, we had less square footage, but at the end of the day, we were at uh, 144,000 square feet. Um, and so, once you have the system set up, you can pretty much adapt to any variable in the lot or in the zoning um, pretty much in a matter of half hour to an hour, regenerate the entire presentation, um, all the calculations, all the square footage, all the material quantities. And um, just to take you through this, this is you know a very quick sectional floor plan, you know, perspectives. Um, with, with all that information. So that's that's a very specific kind of zoning application. We do zoning analysis with the tool for properties all over New York City. Uh, some are much easier, some, you know, eight-story building, what can I get out of it? You model a lot, put it in there. You don't need to go as extensive through all that because you're not creating crazy geometries. And at the end of the day, you can quickly analyze uh, what's as of right buildable um, in any given point. We're doing a very large building now um, I'm just going to skip over to an image that we received today from the render, and I just want to show you this is this is a, a work in progress, but it's a rendering for a project in which 
nothing that you see there was manually drawn. We, we, we drew the outline of the lot. Uh, we had some rectangles to give us what the setbacks were going to be. And then everything was fed through Grasshopper into ARCHICAD uh, in order to generate the model. Um, so it's a very kind of rational application of scripting um, to Grasshopper and having a workflow that takes us directly to, uh, to Grasshopper. So I'm going to jump to another case scenario. We can, um, what I'd like to do later is actually get the connection running, pick something much simpler, not a, you know, 50 story building. And, um, you know, I can show you how the connection works with simple geometry and you can make, make it work. Uh, so let me jump to, um, another project. And this will allow me to skip. Okay, so this was a, a client contacted us in Dubai. Um, she wanted to do a coffee shop in front of the ocean uh, in Jumaya Beach. Uh, Jumaya Beach is the main strip, the main drag in Dubai. Um, she wanted something contemporary. Uh, I was working with, with Karen Rashid. We were partners in the firm when we created it. Um, it was a client that came to me through him. And we started working together with different concepts. Um, we decided to do one concept, which was uh, entirely done with this methodology. So we we decided not to draw a single line. Actually, we, we created a circle in Maya, and we stretched it to an ovaloid shape, which was the coffee bean. It was kind of the, the logic behind what we were trying to do. They're obsessed with coffee beans, and what they, they want to do is they wanted to basically take the Williamsburg um, roasteries and the feeling of this in th these industrial buildings that 18th century buildings that have been turned into you know high-end coffee shops they wanted to do it in dubai and they showed us buildings of like fake brick and you know fake steel and we were like you can't re accurately reproduce an 18th century or 19th century building that's been converted in one shot in dubai it doesn't make sense why don't we do something industrial that's more you know working with materials of the 21st century and uh, it took a lot of convincing, but what we presented to them is that if we took the, their idea of roastery and the coffee bean, you know, and we took it in front of the ocean, which is they're literally, it was a municipal piece of property right in front of the ocean. They were obsessed with the drive through and we told them no. And, you know, being a Manhattanite, it was like, why do you want cars and the fumes? But they insisted. So we had to incorporate a drive through in this, which later they dropped, but it was part of part of the concept and the heart of this was the roastery where they bring you know the the the, the raw grains and they actually roast them there and they make it part of the experience of, of going to the coffee shop and so there was all this talk about the interior space around that roastery and the exterior space that people could hang out around this um, this building you know and, and enjoy the ocean and there was talks of skate parks and you know using the full extent of the municipal land um, the building was only allowed to have 200 square meters, so it's 2,000 square feet, but they had a, a lot that was several thousand square feet, and they were supposed to at least give a presentation to, to the use of, of the land in the future. So again, this was modeled in Maya. It was a circle. We stretched it, dumped it into Rhino, and I'm showing you a snapshot of the final uh, kind of blueprint for the entire building. Um, which is completely parametric. And what we did is we basically decided, well, if we have an ellipse, we can take a slab. And with that slab, we can offset it and create a roof. And between that, we can span channel glass like Stephen Hall has done in his beautiful buildings. And we can do everything from the foundation. And pretty much there's no reason to, once you have that guideline, to do anything by hand. So. Um, you can see we have a building perimeter. We're taking the area. Mm -hmm. So we scaled the circle until we got as close as possible to uh, 200 uh, square meters, so 1.199.01. So if we have to change that, we change the circle. The whole project updates. Every channel gets recalculated. Um, pretty much everything gets updated instantly. Um, and then we had the site boundary, which was this incredible piece of land. And uh, right now it's not connected. 
So we rebuilt the curve just so it was nice and clean. And we offset that curve. And that gave, gave us basically a, a, a channel where we could start thinking about having our, our glass just by offsetting it. And then we did that again and tilted it and created a roof. Um, and then we offset the inner core to make this kind of heart. It's almost like an avocado of the interior of the coffee bean. And we lofted between that and the roof structure above. Um, and then we projected different lines towards the surface uh, to create openings for doors, bathrooms, counters, etc. cetera. And, uh, and then we had channel glass going around the perimeter uh, and then the terrain and so, and the roof, right? So this is basically the network of everything going on here with, you know, this is basically offsetting the, um, the, the, the top of the roof. This is creating the, you know, the perimeter, the glazing, and it's all coming from this one curve at the beginning, which is a kind of magical curve, right? And, uh, and then once we have everything, we can start exporting um, to Grasshopper, uh, the building skin, and you know, make sure we know what layer it's on, we can give it specifications, and that sends it out. In this case, we were using a morph, which takes any geometry, any, any geometry that won't crash the computer, it'll just bring it in as a morph, and it's just amorphous blob. But it comes in, and you can do cross sections with it, and you can give it thicknesses, and you can give it material. It won't perform as a slab, you can't do accurate mm -hmm. you know, engineering calculations on it until you convert it into something better, but, um, we at the time were, were trying to figure that out and this this again was the slide i was showing before which is just the menu of all the different parts and pieces that archicad accepts gracefully once you connect to to grasshopper um so we were using a zone which is great because you know you can calculate a zone its height and whatever from the perimeter and you get the exact you know square footage that you need uh the wall for example for for the glass paneling um and so this was the lot and it was situated between the lot you see the the car um, everything came in here um, as is except for the tag for the asphalt road and the car which we dumped in there um, but at least it gave us a kind of a situation of how this building was going to interact with with this this road that's in front of the ocean right? so this is a quick internal screenshot it's not even a rendering it's just what the computer shows you we dropped some tables in there um, you know did some quick photoshop kept it for ourselves to kind of think, okay, what could be going on in the background, you know? This was kind of the, the reaction. And so we had this, this glass garage door. Um, the radius at the tip is actually a, a, clean, um, a clean radius. So we could actually have a double hinge door or a single hinge door that would act as a garage door there for humidity and, and obvious reasons. This was the interior of, of the space going up. Um, and of course, camera sheet furniture because we were working together. So make, made the space you know, feel, feel even better and more scaled. Um, we were thinking of, you know, these, these kind of outdoor terraces in front of, in front of the ocean. Um, and so here, when we receive this plan, this is an Archicad, when we receive it, um, I'm gonna plug in, because I'm getting it. Too much um, when we receive this drawing, you know, basically we laid out tables in Archicad and, um, <laughs> created some sections of, of the model. And what you'll see next are the automatically generated sections um, and drawings that, that came from the model once it was received with very little production work on our end. Andre, do you know where you can pull up the NEP drawings for the building, we'll find outlet somewhere. So I'm going to keep I'm going to keep going until we run out of batteries. Um, I think I have too many things running at the same time. So these are just uh, you know elevations that are being generated from the model, uh, front and back, north and south elevations. These are the interior sections. So you see, Archicad does a pretty good job of receiving the model, and just by telling it, you know, it's a foundation slab. This is glass. This is a cross section of a roof with a you know simple membrane on top. It receives the information pretty well. The furniture is well come, you know, is, is native. So, and then we had some stats on the building quite, quite quickly, um, where we were looking at, oops, where we were looking at the amount of glass panels, 
And uh, oops, so you can see the, the ground floor internal gross retail area um, and the ex exterior kind of gross area around that. So we're pretty close to 200. That inspector's gonna get, you know, on an oval shape is gonna um, give us too much trouble. And then over here, um, you know, again, the, the, the area and, oops, and we have panel calculations where the panels are basically rounded to the closest production number. So we know that the panel is uh, eight inches wide. Um, and that allows us to know that we have 560 panels at 381 square meters of surface area. And so the cool thing is it won't generate a half panel. It'll either do you know 560 or 561 and that'll change our radius of the square footage up or down and so as a quick modeling tool you know i think we pretty much from concept to schematic design presentation um it was it was about a week and um so you know we have proprietary details from the channel system of how to insulate best we threw that in there you know uh, my interior designers took the shape sort of really getting in there and laying out, you know, more developed floor plans. Uh, we took some of their comments and some of their branding concepts and, and, and translated them into industrial materials that were contemporary, uh, things, things that feel industrial but don't have to be 18th, 19th century. Um, you know, Karam's furniture and a selection of, of other furniture that's, that's, that went really well with the building, some beams and some um, mid-century furniture, plumbing fixtures, um, designed by, by Karam and, and then threw in some, some, um, some more details. Then, you know, once, once we got to that point, we had it rendered um, and uh, we were ready to present. So it's kind of showing that the same process, you know, works for something as, as um, pragmatic as a zoning analysis or for conceptual design to generate a building. Um, the workflow is the same. You're basically coming up with an idea you have limitations and constraints on the idea and you're building the network of relationships between those constraints in the geometry, the site and the program to try to create um, a geometry that ultimately gets passed into Archicad, which is a, a, an excellent <clears throat> receiver of the information and a translator into presentation mode. So rather than having this, you know, just odd shape and rhino, you can't do anything. I'm now putting elevations, sections to scale uh, which, which are, which in turn can be further developed into construction drawings. Um, we're still working on 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 the exterior. So here's here's another shot of the interior with the channel glass. Um, here's the you know the, the the rear end of the building, some seating areas. It's the roastery in the center. And uh, here's some shots. We're still working on. I'm not happy with but of the exterior and kind of. Um, the relationship to to the context. Um, okay, so <clears throat> now we're going to jump to something a little bit more um, conceptual. <laughs> um, so we've managed um, to do a, several several things. So one is um, through different pipelines and through scripting. Um, when we aren't able to do something that we want in Grasshopper, um, if for any reason the tool doesn't exist, um, we can use scripting languages to write our own tools and to do very specific things. Um, Grasshopper accepts many programming languages. Um, my favorite, for the only reason being that it works on Mac, Linux, and uh, OS Tag, is Python. And it's a it's growingly more and more popular. Um, I have a little brother who's 10 years younger than I am, who's a geologist. He uses it um, for GIST mapping and geology. Uh, scientists use it. It's a, it's a language that more and more people are, are interchanging ideas and using. So it opens up to a wealth of knowledge. In, in my case, it's not a, a very kind of uh, isolated language, but actually opens you up to, to a lot of other things. And in Grasshopper, um, you know, it's, it's very easy to um, 
to just take a script like this, Python, drag it down, make your own button, name it what you want, add some lines of code, and get A to do something to B and generate a, a custom a custom node with a custom connection. Right? Um, one thing we've been working on is sound and MIDI and how you can basically create patterns from music, um, but also patterns in um, patterns in geometry. So this is just a quick example. I hope it runs, it doesn't crash, we'll, we'll see. Um, so if I have everything ready, so just to explain, this is, this is a regular keyboard. And depending on what notes you hit, you're gonna get a you know, sequence. When we were in college, we were experimenting with algorithms and computation, and we were creating a lot of interesting form, and none of it really ever got to architecture. Um, it was more experimental. And we were creating our own sort of scripts and languages, and um, you know, we would go A goes to B goes to C, and what happens if you connect that to computational geometry and what kind of shapes do you get? And, and there's a lot of beautiful examples of people doing fractals and many other things out there. But uh, what we discovered is, you know, music is already a language. It's, it's already uh, universal. Um, it has its rules, it has um, its structure. And, you know, if I play a sequence of notes in a certain way, that's recognizable. There's a, there's a way to write that down, there's a way to remember that. And if that translates into geometry, then I can actually create geometries or patterns that I could remember or that I could recreate by knowing what I played. So what I'm going to show you is a, is a video, several videos of uh, different geometry that have all been um, created by sequences of sounds. And that sequence of sound is basically driving the geometry. So first I'll show you a couple of videos of how that generates, and then we'll play a sequence and then show you how it's connected. Um, then if we have time, and I'm not boring you guys to that, to show you how we've gotten it into Rhino. So we can, from the keyboard or an electric guitar, or we can create sequences of music that in turn are telling Rhino what patterns to create when we create surfaces um, or geometry. And so we're working on a project for a church right now in which the goal is to take the choir music and take the sequences mm -hmm. of the choir music and use that to generate ornament inside the auditorium space and inside um, their, their space, also on their buildings and anywhere we can get away with doing it where they won't break the bank and we can afford to, we, we will try to do it. Um, and it's a good way to create variation and a little bit of character in projects that otherwise you know, have a random repetitious, you know, pattern. Um, okay, so let me see if I can pull up some of these videos. Maybe. Sorry, I'm trying to remember where I placed them. Okay, here we go. So some of these are actually named, um, you know, according to the sequence of music. And um, and I, I apologize if they're weird because they, they just are. Like whether I'm not a musician, so whatever I'm playing may sound very weird. And then on top of that, the stuff that you're looking at is weird in itself. Um, it it's just an experiment, but it's it's interesting to see how. Um, there's a relationship between what's generating this and what, what it sounds like. Thank you. 
So it's just a few notes triggering basically a, a, a morphing between geometries. And um, technically, you pay, play that sequence of notes, then you're going to get these back circuits. And I think that's, that's the point of, of um, that little experiment. And I have plenty more of these, but I won't torture you with, with them. Um, however, if I can um, take a second to get this running, what this does basically, it's, we're in Maya right now. It just has a geometry. I like to work with things that are closed and topologically continuous so that when they grow, that topology continues and they just become one eternal form that goes on forever. Um, it makes them a little bit more interesting because there's no beginning and no end. And so as we run the script, this is all just basically Python. And um, all this does right here is just kind of loads the script and has a timeline sequence. It's listening to see something happen. It's just running. And what that does is it creates a, a port for Maya to receive the sound from the keyboard. And basically, we can script the sound that's coming in to any function you want. And say, well, if it's a A minor, then delete everything on your screen. Or if it's a if it's a you know C it's a C sharp uh, rotate. You know, so depending on what you play, you're going to get a different effect because you're basically translating notes. Um, and the sequence of notes into commands, right? And so what this does is it's creating a port for us in which um, this will receive the, the port. So I can receive that from my keyboard, for example. And then I can output it to, in this case, um, my. Right? So as I play that, you can start seeing that there's some notes coming in, right? Actually says, if I play the C or the F, you'll get you'll get that note, right? But it's not doing anything right now because it's this script just loads it and just tells it, you know, listen, right? Now, in this script, which is identical, I actually have some code in there where it says, oh, you know, if you're a surface and you receive this note, do this, 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 delete that, 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 that. But basically, anyone can go in there and write their own, you know script the code, put it in there, and if you get that node, it's going to generate something. So uh, let me just refresh the file and just to make sure we don't do something silly. And we're going to run it, and it's going to start listening. And so again, you know, as you start playing, It's going to start morphing or creating geometry in one direction or another. Until it either crashes or I run out of memory. <laughs> I don't want to overdo it because I don't want to have to restart and crash and do all things. So we'll just leave it there. You get the point. Yeah. Um, I think the possibilities of, of, of using music as a as a syntax that's already existed and has been existing for thousands of years and connecting that uh, to create three-dimensional patterns is, is quite powerful for our architecture. Um, so having said that, um, we have now written this for Rhino, which is a big step for us because we had to work with Graphisoft and, and um, Graphisoft really helped us out in providing the Python language that we needed to make the bridge between um, the outside world and Rhino. Rhino has a very archaic, robust Python that the rest of the world doesn't use these days. Um, Maya is using the latest Python. Many other software are using. They use this Python in which you cannot tap into it and make changes. And so the way to do that to overcome that was to write Python scripts outside that would let us run systems that create ports um, for us. And so the cool thing about this, I'm, I'm in Logic Pro, which is a music editing program. Um, if I were to play something and record it, let's say I, I got inspired and actually played something and record it, that recording would, would actually be the same information for Rhino, whether I'm playing it live or it's recorded, it doesn't care because 
it's a MIDI signal that's coming out and it's giving you that information. So once you find a pattern that you like, you can record it as a song. And it, technically, you can play any song you want and get a pattern from it. Right? So you can document certain patterns by what the composition and the music is like. Um, and so then when we're in Rhino, I'm just going to jump over. I'm going to close, close a few windows and try to clean something up. I got too many things open. So we're going to jump over, open a new file. Um, this is one we've been working with. <clears throat> so here, basically, um, two very simple applications of this. One is like a line, <laughs> and the line gets copied in space. And depending on what musical note it is, it'll change the color. So you get a you get a very simple pattern. And the other one is um, basically we take any curve, and if I turn off turn on the curve. Um, should show, but basically take two curves and you lock the surface between them, and you can um, you can basically subdivide the lock surface into as many parts as you want, and then every part of that turns into a different layer, color, shape, geometry, whatever you want to do. I mean, as long you know, it's just coming from the music. So um, I'm just going to load the grasshopper file. I'm going to kill Maya because I think it's taking up a lot of juice. Okay. All right. So this little guy here, if my computer responds, um, is sorry. This little guy here is receiving the information um, from. MIDI, which is basically writing a, a file. So whatever <laughs> latest note I just played, it writes it to a file, which is reading, and that's the bridge that we're using to connect. Right? So um, that is coming in as information in which um, it's being filtered out, whether it's a C, C sharp, D, D. Basically, you have 12, 12 notes in the chromatic scale, and it's filtering the notes based on which they are. And so um, this is just different ways of visualizing what note you just played. So in a sense, this first step is a tuner. It's just a I know tuner. So if I you know, play this note and the connection, oh, I'm sorry, I have to remember to do something. Um, in this case, we're not speaking to Maya anymore. It's offline. We're going to curve architecture's connection. Right? And the MIDI in is coming from the keyboard. Right? So now, just by shifting that connection, if I do this, you get the note. Right? And that's how we're into Rhino now. So if I play this note, F, you're going to get an F, you know, et cetera. Right? So that's also numerical information coming from MIDI sequence, which is also um, hexagonal. So um, in a nutshell, there's only so many keys on the keyboard, and each one represents a letter and a number. And that letter and number can be piped into anything you want. So here we're writing our custom um, little, little Python scripts that say, oh, okay, so if you're coming in and, and if you're this note, the note A, you know, be color A. If your note A sharp, be color A sharp, right? And it'll spit, it'll receive that information from the note and it'll spit out the color. You can do that with anything. You can tell it, you know, in the connection detail, connect this way, connect that way. Um, you know, if it's a 
I mean, the possibilities are endless. Um, so at the end of the day, we have some color swatches here that are being piped into a color node. And that color is being piped out to something else that's basically uh, baking this as we go along. And then we have the option if you want to connect this directly to RPCAD and have that generate info. So if I were to delete all of these lines and all this geometry and um, kind of start over, oops, um, we have this little machine over here, which, sorry, is basically uh, a recorder to time. So we have music, time, and geometry. Without time, we really can't keep track of where we are in the saw. Right? So this just kind of resets it, um, makes sure we can start. And sometimes it gets a little picky, but it should start. So it's running. It's on a generation and it starts listening. And as we start changing the input information, If it's running, it should sequentially go through every every patch in the nerve surface and you know generate something unique. Um, I think for some reason it crashed, so let's start over. Yeah, there we go. So you can see two things are happening. We're we're like just copying lines in space. And we're also lofting patches between two curves. And very simple, it's just kind of changing color depending on what node it's at. It's not anything beyond that. But um, compared to the morphs we were doing in, in Maya, it's just basically our next step is to connect it to a, a morphing machine that's going to receive the directionality in 3D, whether it's XYZ, the degree. And um, and based it off the note. So we're trying to find ways to do this in you know carpet patterns, uh, floor layout, uh, tile layouts, um, paneling on on um, on custom uh, rain screens. Um, you know, and and we're getting to projects where we are um, using this to generate ornament and um, variation and add a little bit of, of, of value um, where otherwise it would just be something you know boring um, so yeah i think to end i'm just going to really quickly for those of you who've never seen um the process of connecting grasshopper to to archicad just show you just how simple it is because it's, it's kind of crazy So I think maybe that we're gonna I'm gonna quit quit right now, it's just easier. And we can we can open it fresh. Okay. So <clears throat> if we're over in in uh RDK, and I'm gonna pick up a, a simple simple project, nothing special. Um not too big of a model, but you know, it's there. I um, just want to show you guys why we're, we're while we're waiting. Um, we recently did a building in the Bronx where we used the pattern um, on the side of a building. So we were we were basically um, having a Voronoi pattern that was cropped to the side of the building. Uh, with a gradient, and that gradient was being generated by uh, the music coming in. And so, you know, we figured, well, you know, this could be ethos, this could be whatever we can afford. We don't know, maybe get a guy up there and paint it. But if it's going to color by numbers, at least we can use it in a way that's creative and, and generated by music and not just another color by numbers. So, this is a, a kind of a very direct application of, of the process to uh, 
a building that, that we're, we own and we're developing um, currently. Um, all right, so back to architect. So, um, so while this loads, I'm going to go and reload right now. <coughs> Um, that's a backyard of another property. And so, yeah, so that's a, a development that's 20 years old. It's a, a community association, and those are the backyards of, of the property, which is at a different elevation. So it's also cool. So if they ever build, they couldn't go all the way in full in the back. They're on the cross street, we're on, on, the, on the avenue. And so, um, you know, unless they get upgraded to commercial use and zoning goes up, they would never, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so this is just to show something really, really simple, really quick, okay. I am in Archicad, this is a building we're working on. Um, a lot of stuff's missing on the drawing, doesn't matter. Um, we basically, we start by going to, to Rhino Let's say we just draw a polyline. So let's say I'm generating this with something more interesting than me just clicking music, whatever you want, right? And at the end of the day, you you know you run Grasshopper, and you can build one of these your, by yourself. We have them built already to save this time. You know, we went out and saved all the all all the setups. Um, once Grasshopper is running, just take a second to load. Um, I'm going to go back to. I'm going to go back to a file uh, that has all our cheats. Yep. No, 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 I didn't buy stuff with settings. We wrote stuff with settings and, and we keep it. I have, so just to show you, um, just like, you know, anyone keeps anything they've worked on. Yeah. Basically, over the years working with Karen Rashid and, and my personal development of Grasshopper files, we have tons of stuff that just generate curvature. And um, I, I keep a little library here. Sorry, bear with me. Uh, keep a little library here of all our um, Grasshopper files. And so in here, um, in the BIM exporter, which we named it, um, we just have a whole bunch of, we have every Archicad uh, typology uh, pre, pre set up, right? So in this case, I'm going to do a slab, okay? We could do a zone or a slab. Let me see what I find here. Um, I'm going to jump over and Let's do a zone. Zone's right here in front of me. It'll be fast. Okay. okay. So this whole thing is red and orange because it's telling you it's not happy. It's not connected, right? Um, the curve, you got it, you have to give it a, a curve for it to be able to read a zone or a slab or you know, any any given object, right? So we're gonna pick this object, right? Um, and then just tell it here. Set that one curve. So now that curve is in the system and it's being referenced there. Matter of fact, if I, you know, if I if I hide this in Rhino and you can't see it, it still shows it to you because it's here. Right? It's it's being captured by Grasshopper. So it's reading the scripting language on this way. So this toggle basically determines whether or not it's on and whether or not Archicad is receiving it. We're gonna leave it off for now, right? And all these things are orange because it doesn't know what layer it's on and it doesn't know what zone category because you don't have a file and you're not connected, right? So you just go back over to Archicad and then in Archicad, you run um, the Grasshopper connection, which is here. Okay, so, and um, start the connection. And it recognizes that you have a Grasshopper library file, blah, 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 and it's connected, right? So, you know, I'm obviously somewhere in space here, 
um, in the origin. I don't know if it matches the origin of the project that should be there. So if I go back, all these things are now happy. They're great. And it's saying, OK, well, what zone do you want it to be? Do you want it to be a community use? I, mean, I, I set these up in my file already because I've been doing zoning category. So I want to say, all right, I want it to be a community center use. Perfect. Okay. We want the zone to be called. All right, living room. But let's say I say, you know, whatever, bathroom. Okay. And you can always do this in Architect. It's just if it's here, control it from here. The number of the room, the height, you know, is it a 12 foot zone, uh, the subfloor thickness, um, what layer do you want it on? So now I have access to all my Architect layers natively within Grasshopper. And it's, it's pretty cool because you can go in there and you know, name whatever you want. The story, what level you're on, right? Are you on the ground floor? You know, And so this is referencing your model. If you have a model of 50 stories, it has 50, you know, it, whatever's in your model will be there. You, know, you want an ID number. Um, and yeah, so once, once I, I turn this on, it basically forwards the information there. It's telling me this is old because this is an old file. So I probably need to, Download um, the latest zone. So here's, by the way, I skipped this part. Um, this is the Archicad tab. So once you download uh, the Archicad connection to Grasshopper, you get this tab that has everything. It has all the um, deconstruct, so you can actually take stuff that's already built in, in Archicad and deconstruct it into Rhino, where you can get points from it and work backwards. Um, design elements, so you can have beams, curtain walls, doors, um, meshes, more solids, shells, it goes on, right? So I'm gonna grab the zone, right? And then the zone over here is newer than the zone I have here, that's why it's red and complaining. So what we'll do is we'll just turn this off for a second, say it's false, I'm gonna connect that over here so that it's receiving correctly. The P was coming from, and you can see if you hover over these, for those of you who aren't familiar with Grasshopper, if you hover over this, it says it's a polygon. It needs a polygon for the slab. Okay, fine. We know that that curves a polygon, so it'll go there, right? This guy over here, he is the stamp position. And the stamp position we'll, we'll play with later, but you know, when you create a zone, it's gonna have a little stamp around it that says, you're on fourth floor, it's called living room, bathroom, whatever. Sometimes that's in the wrong place. You wanna move it around. This little configuration lets me uh, find the centroid of the object, put it there, or you can put it to the left, or you know, whatever you want. So that point will go there. And then last, lastly, we have the settings, and all these settings are basically over here, and they're coming over there, they go there. And this guy, we can actually delete. And now if we turn this on, we should get somewhere in our screen, if I can find it, on the right layer, <laughs> on the right floor, we will get that polygon. And um, let's make sure it's not minuscule. So I'm gonna do a few things. I'm gonna turn on all my layers, make sure it's there. Make sure they're all on. Oops, sorry. Okay. It's just a whole bunch of layers. And then <clears throat> I'm going to make sure that we have this object on the ground floor. So I need to make sure I'm on the ground floor when I'm looking at this. Level one. Yeah. So any plans will go to community center level one. And it may be just a thing where I'm in here. I have no idea the size of this thing. And um, I'm, you know, I didn't even bother to to even look at the scale. I mean, this might be millimetric. So it's a good thing. To, good thing to do is actually see, you know, what units you're you're looking at and, and you know where you are. You know, typically by the time we bring things in, we have an origin point and we're really thinking about where where stuff goes, right? I think our little slab is somewhere in the file. You can't be that stubborn. It's got to be here. Um, Architect's really good at showing me the extent. So if it's not there, it's, it's somewhere else. So assuming this is our origin point.
What's that about the title, sorry? Let's check it out. Oh, so that's that's it telling me that I'm not connected to my server with a lot of objects that aren't that aren't available. Yeah, yeah. I um let's do the following. Let's just make sure we're in the right scale. So the best way to do this is is to actually see what units we're in. Well, you know, yeah, you know what? I may even be, I'm showing all. Hold on. Let me just make sure I don't have any layer filters on. This. That could be it. I'm showing all. I have no overrides. Um, that's fine. This should be everything on. Uh, building scale. And I'm at my expense there. And then if I go back to Rhino, let's just scale this guy by 100. Just in case we're at millimeter land. So this connection's live. So in theory, if I'm moving this thing around like this, it, it should be picking up here as well. Hmm, weird. Let's look at 3D, maybe. It's buried somewhere. Yeah. You know what? Let's let's. Yeah, let's try a slab instead. Yeah, it's not happy. Something happened here. <clears throat> you know, sometimes what happens is when uh, we're running too many scripts and we're running too many versions of Rhino, um, it sometimes gets confused. And so let's see. Let's try something else. Let's try to clean up the geometry. We're going to create a polygon real quick, just a rectangle. Create that here. So under this circumstance, I would normally say, time to restart, too many things going on. 
<laughs> you see for some reason it's not liking it. So I won't torture you by waiting, but um, I'll give it a restart and see if that, that cleans it up. Too many scripts at once might just kill it. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. Two questions. Did you yeah. run? I don't know. Is it just me? Since I've seen the, the music with the shapes, I've been just listening to it and I got it a bit in my mind. Have you tried to input that? Uh, 